Hello, I'm Kathy Nash with the ACES staff, and I want to welcome everyone to today's webinar, which is entitled Information and Knowledge Organization in Digital Humanities, Global Perspectives. Uh, this is sponsored by DCMI, and we're fortunate to have our two distinguished presenters today. We have Cora Golub and also Ying Sang Lu. We also have our moderator, uh, Karen Wickett who is the chair for the Dublin Core Education Committee, as well as an assistant professor at the iSchool um, at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. Uh, I wanna just ask the audience as you, as you have questions, please type them into the question panel box and they will be answered at the end of the presentation. I'm gonna turn the session now over to Karen, who's gonna introduce our speakers, Karen. Thank you, Kathy. I'm Karen Wickett. I'm the webinars chair for the DCMI Education Committee, uh, and I'm introducing Ying Shang Liu. He is a senior researcher in information studies at Oslo Metropolitan University in Norway, and his research lies at the intersection of knowledge organization, interactive information retrieval, and human information behavior. And Cora Golub is professor in information studies at Linnaeus University in Sweden, and her research focuses on knowledge organization in digital document collections, especially on subject access. Uh, and so they will be discussing their book that has just been published and is available, uh, and it's on information and knowledge organization in digital humanities and looking at global perspectives in that topic. Uh, so I believe Cora is going to talk for a while, and then Ying Shang will talk for a while, and then we'll have some uh, time for questions toward the end of the webinar. Uh, so for questions, please, you can put them in the questions. You can go ahead and put them in at any time, uh, and they'll be queued up when we get to that section of the webinar or you can uh, wait until that time. Uh, so uh, thanks everyone for joining us today and I will hand it over to Cora. Thank you so much, Kathy and Karen for the introductions. Thank you so much DCMI and ACES for having us today. I'm also really happy and excited to be here because I met Ying Sheng Liu a long time ago when we were both PhD students and although we've been in touch and collaborated on, on different projects and initiatives, this feels like the crown of our collaboration. Before we go on, I would also very much like to thank all the authors who have been with us for a few years now. Also to the Routledge series editors and the publishers who have monitored the quality and made sure that it, sh it is as it should be. Also, thanks are due to Christine Borgman, who found the time in her busy schedule to provide the foreword, as well as to Marsha Zeng, who already provided the first review on the book's website. Thanks are due also to all the uh, secret helpers uh, who, who are also acknowledged in the acknowledgments of the book, who helped with the editing and reference formatting and the book index. So thank you all. Uh, I'm very happy to be able to be here today and present this book. And um, this uh, talk is structured into three parts. The first one is the role of knowledge organization in digital humanities. This also shows us how we decided to come to proceed with the book on, on this topic. In the second section, we'll talk some more about how the book is structured and what kind of examples of knowledge organization in digital humanities we see from this monograph, but also which ones we would like to also see more of. In the third part, we are then looking ahead where the two fields could intersect and how to best do it, although it's very idealistic, as you will see, how we approach the need to collaborate more. So coming to the first part about the role of knowledge organization in digital humanities, let us start by saying how we define it. If we think about organizing information or knowledge very generally, we know that the practices of knowledge organization are really omnipresent in people's lives. 
from when we create a list of items to buy tomorrow to the legal code. But here, when we talk about scientific fields, then we take Bear Yearland's definition that says that knowledge organization is about describing, representing, filing, and organizing documents and document representations, as well as subjects and concepts, both by humans and by computer programs. Now, I myself was trained, as I assume many of you as well, uh, at, uh, my, during my master's studies in knowledge organization, where knowledge organization was used mainly to support the organization of information resources. And we talked about standards and guidelines to help us create metadata. At the time, they were not called that yet with representations of information objects to support information retrieval of them, such as those held by libraries, archives, and museums. And today we see three uh, different levels of knowledge organization field in practice, that is at the level of conceptual models, so the highest abstraction. In libraries, we have IFLA's LRM model, CDOC CRM and museums, and RIC in archives which are then aligned with hands-on standards on how to actually create the elements and what kind of values to assign. And here we have RDA in libraries, CCO in museums, and DACs in archives as some examples. But cataloging standards don't always go all the way to prescribing all kinds of data values, and then especially for subjects or themes, we need something that's known as controlled vocabularies or subject indexing languages, like Library of Congress subheading, stereodecimal classification, various information retrieval thesauri, and so forth. So knowledge organization is a major discipline within information studies or information science, if you like. But it has applications in numerous areas of human endeavor because the need to organize data, information, or knowledge is indeed omnipresent, as already mentioned. However, we have witnessed quite a few cases and areas of human endeavor where information in the end is being organized ad hoc rather than following specific standards or guidelines. And that has then resulted in systems that underperform and sometimes even effectively prevent access to data, information, and knowledge. Now, what about knowledge organization in digital humanities? It seemed to us as we were preparing this book that it's kind of a hidden theme because we have been witnessing in recent years lots and lots of edited volumes or monographs and anthologies in digital humanities focusing on different aspects of digital research methods, theoretical discussions, education and so forth, but not so much explicitly the field of knowledge organization. So we wanted to find out what about the field of knowledge organization and its role in digital humanities? How much do we know about it? What is its status? what kinds of perspectives and approaches to organizing information in digital humanities do we have? And not just in, in one country, but across the globe. Does digital humanities as a field resort to knowledge organization for best solutions when the need arises, for example, in digital humanities research projects? Do they involve knowledge organization experts? Does knowledge organization as a field successfully address the needs of researchers in digital humanities? How much do we know about their information needs? So these were some of the questions that we started with, and they are still quite um, unanswered, uh, as we will see when we go towards the end of the talk. But um, our vision is that um, knowledge organization in digital humanities is needed in order to help ensure that the best solutions are found for knowledge organization in digital humanities. And in order to do that, it is important to bring the two communities of research and practice together in order to explore potential solutions and jointly address challenges. And with this book, we wanted to 
put one brick uh, towards uh, building uh, this castle. And then bringing together the understanding of the knowledge organization community and ambitious of the digital humanities community, we hope would help provide strategic solutions to the challenge of managing information and thereby resulting in much better information retrieval systems, improving the stewardship of data and digital research outputs, creating more venues for information access and discovering more meaningful information. However, it is important to say that we have kind of been developing um, complementary knowledge and researching it in silos. And um, perhaps this sounds too idealistic, but again, with this volume, we started like this and we would like to point to the need to bring closer other related fields, such as the field of information retrieval, information behavior, and human computer interaction. So information behavior investigates people's information needs, seeking, using, and sharing it across different contexts and roles. Human computer interaction studies the design of computer interfaces for optimal user experience and intersects with several disciplines, including information science. And it is relevant to knowledge organization, given that user interfaces play an important role in how effectively knowledge organization and information retrieval systems can be leveraged. So we regard all these fields as being closely related because they all contribute to understanding the complexities surrounding knowledge organization, information retrieval, and information use. Thus, in order to improve information access in general and in the interdisciplinary fields, such as the digital humanities in particular, it is important to employ knowledge organization correctly in conjunction with each related area of research. When preparing this book, we have identified two major knowledge organization arenas in digital humanities. One is within cultural heritage and the other within academic research. The first one within cultural heritage mostly focuses on the knowledge organization standards mentioned earlier that perhaps many of us feel rather close to from our education in, in library information science, which then today are being adopted um, to be more suitable to the semantic web but also we learn about the semantic web standards like RDF, like making all aiming to make the data fair, findable, accessible, interoperable, and re reusable. And also to link the metadata and data to the degree possible, either using linked data technologies or metadata aggregation in some other ways. All this wanting to make cultural heritage easily discoverable and openly available to all, not the least to digital humanities researchers. The second arena is within academic research. While we use knowledge organization standards and systems mentioned before to support information retrieval in libraries, archives, and museums, in academic research, we need more granular levels of description than the document level common in libraries, archives, and museums. And this is where the massive initiative known as a text encoding initiative is used to mark up research in and support research in textual scholarship. So TEI represents systematic guidelines for representing various aspects inherent within the text that would be of interest to linguists, literary scholars, historians, philologists, dramatists, and so on, whether that be a rhyme scheme of a poem, variations in spelling, references to a spe specific person or place, and so forth. As such, text encoding methods became a common standard in the humanities to explicitly structure the contents of text by marking up constituent parts. So rather than just document level metadata, typical of libraries, archives, and museums, metadata could be applied at the level of chapter, page, paragraph, sentence, line, word, or letter. 
The second subtopic within academic research are automated methods. And interestingly, they're common both to knowledge organization and digital humanities from early days, from punch cards that were used to organize library records. For example, Kilgore in 1939 describes the use of punch cards for library circulation records. And then Roberta Busa's plans to encode Thomas Aquino's writings on IBM punch cards back in 1946 is often considered as the origin of digital humanities. When in 1959 Busa's resulting concordances were created, and concordance is an alphabetical list of words with their immediate preceding context uh, of words. That inspired an information scientist at IBM, H.P. Loon, to design the keyword in context quick index, in which each word is presented together with its surrounding words, essentially the same principle. And that, in contrast with the traditional system of bibliographic indexes, offered a new automated means of creating indexes based on the extracted contents of documents a revolutionary new knowledge organization system. And then in the decades that followed, knowledge organization has continued exploring ways of leveraging computation to move beyond manual information organization towards semi-automated or even fully automated approaches. These automated approaches to representing documents also connect with the domain of digital humanities that focuses on textual scholarship. Applying computational methods to study massive corpora of literary texts has been referred to by Moretti as distant reading, which he contrasts with a slow and partial insight gleaned from the close reading typical of traditional literary scholarship. A common computational method is also topic modeling, used to automatically extract topics in a collection of documents, especially useful for reading, quote unquote, a large number of humanities texts and discovering hidden themes. So automatic topic identification, both in libraries, archives, museums, and in textual scholarship of digital humanities are uh, common and they share the same basic principles. Yet another topic that is obviously relevant for knowledge organization in digital humanities is curating research data, which are so complex and varied across different humanities disciplines but not just research data, also research output, such as databases, softwares that were created in digital humanities research projects. So having introduced our perceptions of what the role of knowledge organization in digital humanities is and could be about, let us now move on to the second part of the talk, where we will show some examples both the existing ones and the missing ones. The existing ones in terms of um, the volume that we are introducing today. So these um, examples are then taken from the book just published by Routledge as Open Access a couple of weeks ago. It's titled Information and Knowledge Organization in Digital Humanities, Global Perspectives. What does it comprise? Well, um, it was it is but it was based on an open call for a proposal which came out several years ago, which was then followed by a review and selection process, following the guidelines of uh, the publisher. Today, it includes twelve contributed chapters, which are preceded by one introductory chapter that provides the background to the field of knowledge organization and its intersections with digital humanities. The book is structured into three parts and when structuring it as often when conducting classification, it was not a black and white matter. It was quite a lot of uh, shades of gray, but um, we had to decide in the end and uh, hope that this was the best solution. In the first part is titled Modeling and Metadata with six chapters. In this part, we cover modeling cultural heritage data, 
which aren't just typical and more traditional types of data and information objects, but also the, the new ones, the more challenging ones. Then there are chapters that address conceptual models that we mentioned at the start of the talk, and also there are potential for harmonization. There are chapters that talk about metadata aggregation. Of course, here we mentioned linked open data. Um, there are chapters that address metadata enrichment, whether in museums objects or uh, for cave paintings. Finally, the last chapter of the first part reflects the need to actually move from organizing data to organizing knowledge, which is also a good example of how when we were providing knowledge organization solutions, we weren't really aware that by inheriting computer science ways to organize data, which was a database, doesn't quite work for some of the users, especially for historians in this, in this case, because they don't work with data as basic units, but as narratives. Anyway, the first part is the largest part of the book, perhaps reflecting the fact that metadata is the dominant area of research within knowledge organization for digital humanities, or it's more likely due just to the way that we structured the call for proposals and, and our networks where it was distributed. The other two parts each have three chapters. The second part is on information management with one chapter that interestingly tries to address ways in which we could still do distant reading and advanced text analysis even on texts that are still in copyright. Another one is about management of lexicographical resources and relying on technologies beyond just what we would typically do within lexicography. And the last chapter in this part is about the management of digital humanities research outputs. So databases, softwares, websites, how do we preserve those as well? How do we organize them and curate them? The third part is about platforms and techniques. And here we have a chapter that's actually driven by digital humanities research and creates as a result a Recogito platform based on geographic information systems technologies. Another chapter is about using data analysis techniques, specifically. Um, identifying topics in a large number of archival documents. And finally, the book ends with user interfaces to cultural heritage collections, specifically to what kinds of browsing visualization techniques we can apply. The subtitle, the subtitle of the book is Global Perspectives, which is to a certain degree reflected in the pool of authors. The 41 authors are affiliated with organizations in 16 countries on four continents. From Asia, we have China, Israel, Japan, and Sri Lanka. And there is Australia, Europe, from which we have Belgium, Croatia, France, Germany, Greece, Norway, Portugal, Sweden, Switzerland, United Kingdom, and North America with the United States of America. When we talk about digital humanities as a field, we like to emphasize its interdisciplinary collaboration, but also its cross-sectoral collaboration. Although this is research volume, it also is characterized by this cross-sectoral trait in that eight authors are affiliated with a cultural heritage institution, a heritage board, and the European Commission and two authors are IT developers. Still, we um, feel and are pretty sure that this is only a, a snapshot and Yingsheng will take over from here to talk about that. 
Okay, uh, thank you for uh, for the uh, overview and uh, a great introduction about the background of the book and how we um, how we got together and then um, work on this uh, uh, book project. It's been a long process, but uh, I'm also very glad that um, the, the book has just been uh, published uh, um, uh, recently. So as uh, Cora mentioned that uh, for the edited book, we had an uh, open selection process. After we received the um, extended abstracts, then we did a reviewing and then um, we, we, we selected a, a few uh, chapters and uh, accepted uh, se several chapters and then we work with the authors um, uh, writing up the, the book chapter uh, based on our guidelines and uh, the publisher's uh, guidelines and so on. Uh, in the process, we also had the input from the publisher regarding the scope of the book and uh, the balance of topics and so on. So uh, it's, it's, quite, it's a, quite a rigorous uh, process uh, for editing uh, this book. And for the themes that are more represented, as uh, Cora mentioned, that um, the traditional, uh, the, meta, the topics about metadata, they are more uh, well represented than the other topics. And unfortunately, uh, there were several uh, chapters uh, we would like to include, but uh, during the uh, editing process, uh, uh, for various uh, reasons, we, we, we didn't, uh, uh, those uh, chapters uh, did not uh, materialize. So for example, uh, we would like to have, uh, to see uh, chapters uh, representing the topics about automatic methods, like uh, such as the entity linking in the natural language processing, or uh, the more recent development uh, about the deep learning models for uh, semantic uh, representations. So these are new uh, developments in natural language processing, and they have been quite successful in uh, recent uh, applications. Another topic is uh, uh, the user perspe perspectives in uh, user interface design and uh, evaluation. Uh, we would like to see more uh, user studies, uh, uh, particularly about the user interface design for digital humanities. But unfortunately, we we, we only uh, include one chapter. Uh, it's not totally uh, an evasion study from the user perspectives. And in general, um, we would like to see more of the humanities uh, driven uh, knowledge organization research, but uh, uh, in the book chapters here, uh, we, we, we didn't see uh, th this kind of uh, uh, research uh, uh, represented in, in, the, in the book. And for the, uh, we, we call the title, uh, the subtitle of this book is Global Perspectives. And we recognize that uh, the perspectives from Africa and uh, South America are not uh, present here. So why this book and for whom? Um, initially, uh, the book was uh, intended to address the gap between knowledge organization and digital humanities. As uh, Cora mentioned earlier, uh, the field of knowledge organization within information studies or information science um, it's a well-established research area. There are also other uh, areas in information science that are, are relevant to uh, knowledge organization, but it appears that uh, uh, they are not well connected. So uh, for example, uh, information retrieval, uh, the relationship between information retrieval and knowledge organization, knowledge organization and um, human computer interaction and so on. So um, the, that's the original objective of this book. And we would also like to uh, have this book as a guide as a guide for the uh, university teachers, researchers and working professionals interested in the role of knowledge organization in digital humanities 
and we feel that uh, um, for those who are new to to this area, uh, they may not uh, have the uh, technical knowledge to understand all the details uh, of the published uh, uh, book or uh, articles. So this will serve as a, a guide uh, for those who are interested in these areas. And for each chapter, uh, we have an introductory overview of the topic under discussion, and then followed by a case study to, to demonstrate um, um, the, the relevance of these concepts and how they have been applied in, uh, in uh, digital humanities. And then um, at the end of each chapter, it uh, includes the reflections and suggestions for uh, future work. And so hopefully uh, this will be a starting discussion uh, point for those who work, who would like to work across uh, these two areas, uh, knowledge organization and uh, digital humanities. So in summary, uh, for the books, uh, uh, for the chapters we have covered, uh, in addition to our organization of the book by the three parts that Cora mentioned, um, these chapters uh, provide uh, snapshots of how information can be organized in various uh, contexts in uh, digital humanities. So um, we can see that there are three main uh, research uh, uh, there are three main uh, areas. The first one is uh, organizing the cultural heritage in uh, digital uh, environments. Uh, we can see the topics like uh, the, the creation and adoption of the conceptual models, meta, metadata standards, the uh, incorporation of the linked open data, and uh, uh, semantic, uh, the enrichment, semantic enrichment of the uh, metadata and also the aggregation and interoperability issues of the metadata across the cross across the cultural heritage uh, collections and the second part is about the managing digital humanities resources and the documents for preservation and the reuse there are also examples about the application of semi and automatic approaches uh, to support a large organization for information access, discovery, and navigation of the materials. So these are the general themes that uh, we can see from the book chapters. And finally, uh, there's a, a reflections on the the nature of the knowledge of production within the humanities. So that's the, the chapter at the end of part one. It, it uh, proposes the uh, reflections on how we think about uh, knowledge organization and knowledge organization uh, systems, not only from uh, importing the ideas from the database based uh, uh, not only from the uh, from the system uh, perspectives. So finally, uh, looking ahead, um, we also identify uh, two uh, core areas uh, for uh, future development in, uh, in this uh, area. Uh, the first one is about uh, information discovery. Uh, including the information search and access and and, and so on. So um, as we can see uh, in the book chapters and also the topics uh, are, are discussed in these uh, uh, chapters, um, there's still a disconnect. There's still a disconnect between the uh, knowledge organization research and the information uh, retrieval research. So um it appears that uh, these are two re uh, research communities uh, at this moment and um, we don't have um, very much uh, uh interaction uh in this uh, area so 
uh, for system designers, they are more concerned about the ranking of the search results, and they believe that the simple uh, search interface, like the Google search uh, single uh, search box, will be sufficient for people. But uh, for the humanities uh, scholars, uh, from our understanding of the uh, uh, information seeking behavior of humanities uh, scholars, we we see that they they need more advanced uh, search interfaces uh, in addition to the single uh, search box. And we we also see that um, there's an insufficient uh, evaluation of the um, uh, semantically enriched uh, cultural heritage uh, data and uh, linked open data in the information retrieval contests. Uh, for example, we haven't seen uh, many studies uh, about the eva uh, evaluation of search interfaces uh, from a uh, user perspective, uh, particularly in the digital humanities uh, domain. And um, so this leads to our uh, uh, proposal that we need more uh, user studies and perhaps uh, participatory uh, knowledge organization uh, studies uh, building up our knowledge organization uh, systems uh, bottom up from the user needs, uh, user uh, information needs, uh, user information search, and how how these uh, uh, knowledge organization uh, systems and structures um, is uh, are embedded in the in their work uh, processes and so on. So these are the future uh, research uh, directions. So uh, another another important part is about the uh, information uh, representation. So uh, I, I just want to uh, mention here a, a key point that um, we need, uh, uh, when we apply the automatic uh, methods, we need to think more critically about how we apply those methods and whether um, they would really uh, serve the purpose of uh, of, uh, of of our uh, research research objectives or our practical uh, applications. So um, another important thing is that um, we don't really represent the context as much or as details as we should in our knowledge uh, organization uh, systems. And uh, this, is one, um, this is one of the uh, key areas that we also need to think about. And in general, in, the, uh, in our research in uh, information uh, representation, it seems that we have seen more um, conceptual work and we also see many uh, cases from our uh, uh, practices, but uh, there's still a, a disconnect uh, between the two in our uh, research uh, field. The final point is about uh, interdisciplinary uh, research. So uh, what, what is the role of a knowledge organization within the digital humanities? And this is an example from our uh, our work in the digital humanities uh, uh, curriculum committee um, organized by the iSchool. Uh, Cora and, and myself, we, are, we were both uh, on the committee. And I think that this would be a good uh, example of showing how uh, the, the role of a uh, knowledge of organization within the digital humanities research. As we can see here, these are the results from the analysis of the course uh, descriptions uh, offered in the iSchool digital humanities uh, programs. So these are the topics or research areas that, that would be uh, relevant to a uh, knowledge organization. For example, the web applications architecture and metadata. These are traditionally well-represented 
uh, in our area. And the second one is the design and evaluation of human computer interfaces. And so this is the uh, HCI research that we mentioned in our presentation. They are not well represented in our book chapters. And also um, the management of uh, language uh, resources. Uh, we have one chapter from lexicography. So it's a, a, also a good uh, example of uh, how that kind of study is relevant to uh, KO within the uh, DH. And finally, uh, interactive data visualization. So uh, with the development of the uh, new technologies, then, and also the data curation and more emphasis on the research data and so on. So it's another uh, research area uh, that could be uh, pursued uh, further. So, um, I think that this, uh, we, um, we really need to have a collaborative uh, research to move our research field uh, forward. And uh, we, uh, yeah, um, we couldn't do all, uh, I, I mean that uh, for the, um, uh, uh, KO research and digital humanities, we really need to have a trans, uh, transdisciplinary uh, collaborations and we need to find our uh, shared research interests and uh, how we uh, work together to address those important uh, research issues. Another point is that, uh, as I mentioned about the uh, interdisciplinary uh, research, uh, from this uh, collaborative uh, research process, uh, yeah, Carl and I, we, we, we both uh, uh, recognize the, our uh, shared research interests and also our, some of our uh, uh, differences uh, from a research uh, perspectives, uh, particularly my perspective, uh, my user perspective and uh, uh, the interactive uh, information retrieval perspective and also the um, Cora's uh, KO perspective. There's still much room for uh, future research collaboration in this area. And um, that's it for our presentation today. And we'll be happy to take your questions now. Thank you everyone for your attention. And thank you for organizing this uh, webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Cora and Ying Shang. Um, so now we can take questions from the audience. Uh, so you should see the question box, which, uh, so you can type your questions in there uh, and I will uh, read them uh, for answers. But um, while we wait, I have a few questions uh, for you. Uh, Ying Shang, you were just talking about uh, your collaborations with Cora and uh, sort of your different perspectives uh, and how you have uh, these kind of different things to bring. I wondered if you two could talk a little bit about uh, the things you've worked on and how you've approached this kind of collaboration. Um, you know, you were mentioning addressing these gaps. And so I wondered if you could talk about kind of like how you two have worked together um, and how you've how you've sort of uh, um, identified projects and then how you've thought about how you br how to bring your two different perspectives together on a project. Well, if if I may start, Ying yeah, sure, yeah. no problem. Um, I think um, what allowed our collaboration to work without any problems is the fact that we had the common aim, and that is to improve information retrieval. And although uh, Ying Sheng is, is a very experienced information retrieval researcher in that specific field, and I work more in knowledge organization, still we were bound by the common uh, targets uh, and, and that kind of helped us um, throughout and also Ying Sheng is, is one of a few or a few even <laughs> researchers who uh, 
do use knowledge organization systems as well to improve information retrieval. And he has conducted research that shows that we should go beyond purely automatic because knowledge organization systems like subject headings systems do help improve retrieval quite significantly. So uh, we always had the connection and then uh, our backgrounds are slightly different, but it, it was no problem to uh, agree when, oh, this is what you mean. Oh, yes. <laughs> 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 um, that, that's from my perspective. Yeah, uh, I guess, uh, mm, let me see. Um, I, I think that uh, uh, from my uh, interactive uh, information retrieval perspective, I, uh, okay, so for, for, for example, uh, Koras um, mentioned that I, I, I studied the usefulness of med medical subject headings um, that to see whether uh, when users use uh, medical subject headings, whether their search performance can improve. And the good news is that yes, but they are only useful for domain experts who, who have sufficient uh, technical knowledge of, in the biomedical domain. So to make the best use of the medical subject headings, you need to have a sufficient level of te te technical knowledge. So uh, from this uh, perspective, then I would question the, I, I will have some questions about the uh, knowledge organization systems that we have uh, built over the years. Are they really useful? And under what uh, circumstances, under what conditions? So the kind of study is important, but it's rarely done. Are they because it's very resources uh, uh, intensive and also it's hard to do it well and um, it may not be appreciated by both uh, research communities. So, <laughs> but yeah, we are getting there. So I, I think that um, uh, to advance our research field, I, I, I think that, uh, um, yeah, we, we need to have um, more collaborations uh, on this part. But again, um, to do the kind of research project, then we need to work together and we need to identify, like uh, Cora said, the, the, uh, our shared uh, uh, objective to improve the system for the, our end users, right? We, we are just uh, taking from uh, different approaches. I have a uh, IR uh, information retrieval evaluation perspective, and I, I will only believe that the, uh, the system really works because the, the user's uh, search performance uh, uh, improves. But from those who are working on uh, in the area of knowledge organization, then probably they wouldn't ask this question so critically. Yes, and, and the, when at the start of the presentation, I, I talked very bluntly about, oh, well, you know, information is organized ad hoc or purely algorithmically and therefore it fails. Well, it's not, again, black and white truth. Um, and it's not to say that knowledge organizations uh, don't need improvement, that improvement, that they are perfect. They are, and we are well aware from the literature that they also can prevent access to information. If we just take the example of LGBTQ literature not being able to find for various reasons, due to the lack of knowledge of the indexer or simply lack of enough subject headings, which effectively also prevents access to information. Uh, so uh, things are um, a bit more complex. And, and we also have seen from this chapter by Dominic Oldman on the fact that historians don't or do not find data bases useful if the data is the essential organizing unit rather than narratives. And how do we organize that? How do we connect that? So we, we need to talk more between also related uh, fields like information behavior and, and HCI, and, um, information retrieval, 
bring a bridge across. Sorry if this sounds very idealistic, but this is <laughs> this is how we are. Yeah, unfortunately, there are also gaps among these uh, research areas. So information uh, behavior and information retrieval. Yep. And also information retrieval and human computer interaction. Yep. All the different kinds of gaps. Yes. Well, I think your book uh, does is an is a really um, is working nicely in that space to kind of bring these topics together in a single book. So it's it's exciting to see that. Um, I have a question here from Anna Marie Close, and she says, "I'm glad you mentioned IRs." As someone who mentioned who manages an IR for digitized and born digital collections, it is often frustrating to deal with the structural limitations of an IR. Uh, and I'm I think that's institutional repository or maybe just an information retrieval system. I'm uh, oh, I but yeah. uh, <laughs> do you have any thoughts on how IR limitations affect digital humanities research? Um, so I think um, I think <laughs> yes. So yeah. so either <laughs> both. Please take it away. Well, yes, they they really do. And again, um, the question is where the problem is. And I've I've done some speculations in my research and some published work as well, um, showing that it it's it's just a bad tradition that. Um, few people really take care about and they don't push enough for change at the level of system developers but also at the level of the library who decides to acquire a certain information retrieval system and doesn't put enough enough demands um, and and the, the systems that we use in libraries archives and museums today are often uh, suboptimal for the end users especially when it comes to subject access and, and uh, all the metadata that create, we create using knowledge organization systems, they are not visible at the level of the interface. They don't, there are few interfaces where you can actually do word sense disambiguation, for example. And then that, of course, effect, affects uh, finding information which may affect digital humanities research and result in duplication of efforts and missing important publications, data sets, et cetera. It, it, we, I, I don't know if any researchers has actually explored the effect of one on the other, but one can assume that this could easily happen. Yeah, I just want to comment on the, <clears throat> the uh, about the uh, information retrieval system or the uh, Institutional repositories. Yeah, so I got a, I got a clarifying note. She does mean institutional repositories. Oh yeah, yeah, that's uh, fine. So. Yeah, uh, institutional <laughs> repositories. Uh, uh, actually, um, um, the, um okay. Uh, the, the stat, the studies are showing that uh, for the uh, managers are uh, institutional uh, repositories. All the professionals are working uh, within that uh, domain. Uh, they don't have sufficient techni technical knowledge to implement the weighting of the metadata fields for their systems. How do you know that uh, which weighting scheme should be used and which would be more useful for the users? So it's another kind of gap, uh, uh, another kind of gap in our understanding about the system and our technical knowledge about the system and uh, how it's being used in practice yeah i feel like that also goes back to what uh cora was saying earlier about the goals about goals right and that institutional repositories uh as they were sort of originally conceived were, very, were more sort of about preservation and stewardship of resources and less about discoverability and uh kind of uh how the but but why save it if no one's going to use it, right? So I think there's a lot to be done there. Okay, we had another question from Ashish Gosain. What are the key intersectionalities in the realm of globalized knowledge production in digital humanities? Any current research themes or influences that relate to specific methodologies? 
Uh, so kind of what are what are the intersections here, I think? Well, I, I think that the 12 chapters is still a very small sample to be able to, to make any large claim on such an important question. Um, what, what we have been noticing is that uh, I think the, the most important lack that we are noticing is that somebody who identifies themselves as a digital humanist, no matter how interdisciplinary that is, doesn't often relate to uh, publications or conferences from knowledge organization, which then creates the gap. And unfortunately, I think that's the main characteristic throughout the world <laughs> today where we're at. Um, but, but hopefully we can help uh, change this. And, and also we would like to see a knowledge organization that's driven by humanities research questions uh, to be able to understand it more and address it in, in the best possible way. I mean, we're also, maybe not directly from the book, but we're also, uh, the discussions are a lot about the fact that we have these knowledge organization systems, especially to ensure better subject access, but whenever a new project is started, and that's just not for humanities, but uh, many other disciplines, they reinvent or they invent a new knowledge organization system, which is not according to the ISO thesaurus, for example. Uh, so it's not standardized in any way. It's not interoperable. It, the, it's not even based on semantic web technologies uh, to support that kind of access in the future. So that is another um, big problem that we've been noticing. And I think that also comes boils down to the reason of uh, not enough collaboration between the fields. Okay, so we've just got a couple minutes left. So, and we have a question here. Uh, but I think this should be our last question. Uh, this is from Marcin Rosowski at the University of Warsaw. I fully agree that it would be interesting to look at KOS from an HCI perspective. How do you find the existing methodological frameworks for such research? So this is kind of, I think, what, what kind of methods can we use to bridge between those two uh, sort of fields? Yingxiang, you've done some research. Yeah. Uh, uh, I think that um, uh, there's a good uh, review book. Uh, it's called uh, Mu uh, HCI Research in Museums. So it has covered all, all the different uh, aspects. But I, I think that uh, from uh, information science, we usually do uh, user, uh, user studies uh, with a qualitative approach or quantitative uh, approach. Then if you, uh, I've done more uh, quantitative uh, approaches uh, to the user studies. So it's a, the study was uh, conducted in a controlled uh, exper experimental uh, environment so that we can see the, the uh, specific effect of the knowledge organization system or other uh, system features on uh, user uh, performance. Another approach is like um, the, the, from the design methodology, so it's the uh, participatory uh, design or other uh, design methods. Uh, so you get those uh, stakeholders uh, in the beginning stage of your research project and build on your system and um, system features and evaluation and so on. So there are all kinds of uh, methodological approaches that uh, we can use to address the proposal research questions. But the challenge is that uh, when you have a large uh, research group, then we have a different uh, backgrounds and methodological approaches or preferences. It will be quite challenging uh, to organize or conduct this kind of studies. So it's also, uh, it's challenging, but it's also rewarding in the sense that we know, we learn so much about uh, uh, each others. So just a less point. The other day I found out that the contextual inquiry in human computer interaction research is the interviews that we use in our field. 
but it's called contextual inquiry. Right. Different languages, but we say uh, similar things. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. We, without the kind of collaboration, then we wouldn't we we, we wouldn't uh, understand each other. And it's also about the importance of knowledge organization systems, control vocabularies. The contextual inquiry. No, I thought, oh, it's really new. Then when I dig into it, oh, it's it's the interviews, uh, different kinds of interviews, uh, methods, the techniques that we have used in our studies. So there's a there's a lot to build on there. I think we <laughs> do have a lot in common. We just need to talk to each other, right? Yeah. Okay, we yeah. are we are we are out of time. Uh, thank you uh, to our attendees and question askers. If you have further questions, please reach out to our authors here by email. Uh, and I will hand it back now to Kathy Nash to uh, end our webinar. Thank you both, Ying Sheng and Cora. Uh, thank you, Karen, uh, for moderating the session, and thank you to both of our presenters. This was a super webinar, and I know that we had a a very engaged uh, audience. So thanks to all of you. I just quickly want to remind those who do attend um, uh, the webinars that one of your many ACES member benefits is complimentary access to all of our webinars. A recording of today's webinar and a copy of the slides will be posted to the ACES website uh, by tomorrow and it'll be available to all ACES members and paid registrants uh, within 24 hours attendees are going to receive an email that will include the recording and a survey and i encourage you to please uh, fill out the survey within seven days as your uh, feedback is really important to our future planning again i'm kathy nash with the aces staff i thank you for attending today's webinar and look forward to uh, more webinars in 2022 thank you all